we have, we're going straight into Martin's session now, and Martin thankfully shouldn't need any introduction. However, he is the uh, Chief Executive Officer of the Royal Flying Doctor Service and a Director of the National Disability Insurance Agency. Thanks, Martin. Thanks. Uh, can I once again acknowledge the traditional owners of this beautiful land on which we meet and pay respect to elders past and present. Can I also uh, address some of the confusion that is probably existent as to why I'm speaking uh, with you this morning. Uh, please ignore my day job just for a moment. Uh, I have the great privilege of serving as a director of the National Disability Insurance Agency. I've been on that board uh, since the NDIS was established. At uh, 10 o'clock last evening, I received a text message telling me that a presenter for today was unable to be here and would I step in and fill a slot? So I took advantage of that opportunity. And the reason I did so is because the approach I've taken through the Rural Health Alliance uh, in relation to the National Disability Service is to ask on every possible occasion where there are problems, I'd like to know about them so that I might be able to work with the agency to attempt to resolve them. So that's what I'd like to invite you to think about today. And in just a few moments, uh, I'll invite your questions or feedback to identify challenges and problems that in partnership with the agency, I might be able to address. At the risk of creating just a little more confusion, can I also commend Anne Nichols for her presentation on the Carers Gateway? Um, I also happen to serve on the board of Health Direct, and Health Direct uh, is not well known, but its services are. The National Health Service Directory in particular is a very important tool for health service providers and consumers in country Australia. And I'm so delighted that Health Direct uh, is a supporter of this conference. Can I just make some uh, comments about where the NDIS is at, this great national reform that's underway? Uh, today, the scheme is about at its halfway point in rolling out packages to people with disabilities uh, who live with a significant and permanent disability that impacts um, their daily life. We're at about 250,000 participants now, leading up to 460,000 participants over the next 18 months. Importantly, the scheme is not for everyone. When the Productivity Commission designed it, they were looking at identifying the opportunity for choice and control for those that have a permanent and significant disability that impacts their daily living that needed particular support. But as we know in Australia, there are as many as three million citizens with disabilities, and it's important to remember it's not for everyone. One of the great successes of the NDIS is that state, territory and the Commonwealth governments agreed to double the amount of funding that had previously been available for citizens in state and territory systems. And that increase in resources comes with both opportunity and challenge as to how that resource is then deployed most profoundly on the workforce that is required to support delivery of services to people through the NDIS. I take comfort that the satisfaction of participants in the scheme today of participants rating their experience, 85% say their experience of the NDIS is good or very good. And that's a significant marker of how the scheme is delivering for participants. But there's a flip side. If 85% are recognising their experience as good or very good, that means for 15% of scheme participants, it's not. And there's a set of reasons that have to be addressed to ensure that the scheme works for all citizens. For those that don't rate their satisfaction, it might be that they've not been able to access the type of service that they want, or they haven't been satisfied with the planning assessment that's been conducted for them. You might appreciate that the focus of the agency is on those 15% who don't express satisfaction with the scheme to ensure that 
as the scheme develops and matures, it might improve that outcome. The scheme has represented a profound change for service providers. The shift from block funding to consumer purchased care is easy to say, complicated in its delivery. Some providers have done well, others are challenged and will continue to be so. And the important emphasis that has to be placed on ensuring that the scheme participant doesn't miss out on a service as this transition continues is again the priority of the agency. But you can appreciate, and as a former service provider myself, I come to the NDIS because of the role I had in leading one of the larger service providers in New South Wales, is that this is a profound change and that change hasn't finished yet. For rural Australia, and then for remote Australia in particular, this presents the same types of challenges that we face in healthcare. In parts of the country where there are not established providers and small populations mean that there's not ever going to be a competitive market in response, the agency is working through how to ensure that services are available in remote and rural areas where they're going to be needed. We're also yet to properly work out each of the boundaries between the health system, the NDIS, the education system, the NDIS, and the criminal justice system, the welfare system. The NDIS funding is for disability services and not necessarily to supplement education, health, or other funded services. And I think that's why Karen and Nerida's research in relation to the planning of services for people in the education system who also have NDIS packages is so terribly important. And I commend the thinking that you're giving to this area and know that it has to apply across other government portfolios as to how we plan the interaction with NDIS resourcing and education, social welfare and the health system in particular. But it's perhaps workforce uh, that is the one that worries me the most. Uh, the Social Services Minister on Friday of last week released new information that signals there is still going to be demand for an additional 90,000 staff to serve participants' plans through the NDIS by the time it gets to full scheme. And we have to acknowledge the pressure on the health system, the aged care system and the disability system at the moment as to how we ensure we have the workforce and the skills within that workforce that are required. But for this room, most importantly, that those skills are distributed around the country. And again, that's a profound challenge that we've not worked out in health yet. And we similarly have to work out in both aged care and disability at exactly the same time. So for that reason, I'm delighted that Claire's work and presentation today is thinking about some of those issues as it relates to allied health professionals uh, in particular. The question uh, that uh, she concluded her discussion with is that possibly the support for the training and placement of allied health professionals in disability service organisations is going to need the support of both the NDIA and other funding bodies in the years ahead. And I think that's exactly the right conclusion Again, if you go back to the Productivity Commission's thinking when it designed the NDIS, it calculated a full scheme cost of 22 billion when the scheme is at full capacity, when there's 460,000 people within it exercising choice and control. Now that 22 billion premises the service provision to those citizens for choice and control. It wasn't necessarily premising the role of training and development for a health workforce because that exists in other pockets. And I think this transition to the NDIS has revealed a series of gaps. And one of them is how we ensure the resourcing for the clinical placements, the training of a health and an allied health workforce as it relates to disability service provision. And having listened to the discussion today, Claire, I'm going to take these particular issues back into uh, the agency for discussion. But going a step further, John Dennehy's question 
uh, was perhaps even more pointed. Uh, will the NDIA allow the funding of students for the provision of services to scheme participants? Well, we know that that uh, policy answer is yes. Uh, participants are able to exercise choice and control within whom they receive their services from. So applying that high level thinking, um, there's not necessarily a barrier as to where a participant can receive their service from. But John is alluding to a decision, a possible decision of the Department of Veterans Affairs, of which I'm not across, that um, a direction uh, has been given at DVA as to whether or not students are able to be involved in service delivery. Well, my understanding is that there's not such a direction with the NDIS, but the issue of policy creep is one that I'll take back to the agency and seek a clarification on. And perhaps through the peak bodies for allied health, get a message back as to the role of students in the service provision through the NDIS uh, as to what's permitted uh, and to how resource uh, might be properly applied to that. So with those comments, I've hopefully addressed at least the matters that have been raised in this session today. Uh, I've left about uh, 10 minutes in our time together. For any other issues that you'd like to raise, uh, critiques are sincerely welcomed because the role of the board of the agency is to continually refine the way in which the NDIS is being delivered to make sure it meets expectations. So are there any questions or comments? Uh, there's microphones on either sides of the room. There's a hand in, uh, up in the air. And if you wanted to just approach the microphone uh, and let us know where you're from, um, organisation and interest, and I'll do my best to respond. Thank you, Martin. Ooh, sorry. And thanks for stepping in at short notice. My name's Leanne Evans. I'm with Exercise and Sports Science Australia. Good day, Leanne. Just a question about the training of planners in terms of, um, are there any uh, priorities coming forward in terms of expanding the training of planners to understand the role of allied health professionals? Yes, is the short term answer. Uh, you may be aware with uh, the changes underway to the planning process through what's called the pathways review. The planning process was established during the pilot phase of the NDIS, and as planning started to occur, we saw inconsistencies occurring across the country. Perhaps not surprising, as you bring together a state and territory scheme into a national framework, and there being local experiences in different states and territories that were playing out in the planning process. So a refinement to uh, planning was undertaken. Um, it was tested and consulted nationally uh, to outline how we could improve the planning process referred to as pathways. And that information is available for scrutiny uh, on the website. It hasn't been fully implemented across the nation as yet. It is in uh, rollout as we speak, but it bolsters the training required for planners. It increases the uh, perhaps oversight of planning decisions to look for inconsistencies uh, where it is possible to compare one plan with the other where there are common themes. If there are outliers in decisions, the system is now looking as to why. But unquestionably, as more planners come into the scheme, planning processes are going to be better informed by the role of local, co local area coordination and also the greater advocacy for the participant as they come to the scheme to know what it is choice and control means for them. That what I think we need to uh, recognise and still have um, a patience with is that we're bringing in participants who've had experience of a block funded scheme where choice and control and self-determination hasn't been part of the culture and now it is, just at the same time as state and territory governments have made different and perhaps inconsistent decisions about the role of advocacy organisations and personal advocacy for participants as they enter and uh, experience the scheme. So I think there's a number of factors, improving the pathways and planning process, greater training for planners themselves, 
uh, the role of local area coordination and better planning and advocacy for the participant before they come to the scheme, but then also as the maturity of scheme participants uh, in their second and third plan reviews should see that plans start to fully meet the needs of participants. And that's when I know we'll see the satisfaction rate lift above 85% as more participants are satisfied with what they're receiving. Hi, my name's um, Megan Baum from the University of Newcastle. G'day, Megan. Um, thanks for your answer about planners because I know um, I'm a speech pathologist and special education teacher. And as well as working at the university, I've been a provider for the last five years, and I'm now researching the NDIS around Australia for children with hearing loss. And one of the things about choice and control that parents continually say to me is that providers are paid a transport allowance. However, through the transport for allied health access that they might need specialised, parents are not able to use their NDIS funding to travel for choice of a specialist allied health person um, to access them. So I think just as feedback, parents are saying, I have funding I can't use because the local services don't have the specialist skills that I need and I want to use that funding for transport, but they're unable to do that. So if I've understood the distinction, uh, service providers resourced for travel for speech pathologists to uh, go and conduct a service, but when the uh, family or the participant themselves is travelling privately, uh, that funding is not available for them to access the service. So there's a confusion between service provider and, and private travel. Yeah, that's right. So if they want specialist audiology services and things, they can see a specialist medical professional and have that funded through PATS, but not for allied health and audiological services and other specialist services that they would need that aren't medical. Yes. So, so the funding of transport has been a matter uh, that has been uh, tested in the Administrative Appeals Tribunal. And I think you might um, infer from something that has to go off to a judicial review that it's an area that is still grey that um, the way in which we ensure distance and geographical disadvantage doesn't get in the way, without stepping in and meeting the costs that are normal in a family's experience is one that is just not black and white. So that in some circumstances, plans will provide for travel when there is a known barrier to participation in daily life. But plans also are not wanting to uh, overstep the line between what is the normal role of a family in supporting the opportunities for their child. And it's grey, and I can't give a definitive black and white answer. It tends to be assessed, in fact it is assessed on the circumstances that present. But what I'll do is I'll take the technical issue you've drawn a service provider in an organisation is resourced a rate for travel. A participant is not when they access a speech pathology session where in comparable arrangements there might be a funding for transport for medical care. Mm. I think it's a good issue to have considered, but I won't suggest that it's one that is necessarily black and white, but thanks for raising it. Sure. And can I just say one more point? Um, just to bring up the um, requirements for providers now. So as a sole trader, part-time speech pathologist, I know a lot of other sole trader, part-time people, and we are all networked, but um, I've, sh I've stopped providing. And I suppose the flip side maybe of that 85% of satisfaction of participants is are the providers satisfied? And are they getting the support they need? And I suppose um, we want to maintain that choice and control, but they do get access to qualified providers. So for Lynn's benefit, I'm aware I've got one minute uh, before lunch and I'll stick within that time frame. The, um, uh, perhaps, uh, priority that needs to be placed on the participant's satisfaction to ensure that there is enough service for participants 
must be balanced with the need for there to be a service provider market. And in areas where we find pressures, where service providers are ceasing, pulling out, or there is risk of market failure, uh, the agency has to be very concerned because if we set a threshold test of participants missing out on the care that they're entitled to, we've designed something uh, that is at risk. So I can give you that assurance, particularly as a service provider of health in areas of market failure in, thin in small populations, we have to ensure that we get the settings right, that pricing is right, and the support for providers is right, and indeed the barriers to entry are not too much, because if the participant misses out, we've created something we didn't intend to. So it's a principle that I'm very sensitive to, and I know that the agency is as well. Look, thank you for the opportunity to speak with you. Um, I'm here for the next three days. Um, you now know who I am. Um, come and see me and speak with me directly if there's anything I can address. Thanks so much.